to imagine if Titanic were a car, it would be one of those trucks that you see on the freeway when you're driving with your parents. Or if it was a house, it would be a castle with a million rooms. I want you guys to think if you've ever seen anything Titanic. So for me in my life, when I think what's huge, what's Titanic, I think of my textbooks from when I was in school. These things are much bigger than any other book I have. And so in my brain, these are Titanic size. So to get our chat box flowing, why don't you guys type in anything you have that you think is Titanic? It could be a really big dog in your neighborhood or anything you can think of. Go ahead and put that in the chat box. A tree, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Roller coaster, nice. Disney cruise ship, that's perfect for what we're talking about. The Amazon, another good answer. You guys are full of so many good answers. Carnival Cruise, I see a lot of cruise ships, guys. That is perfect, because that's what we're gonna get into. Because not only was Titanic the name of a ship, but it meant a huge ship. So let's take a look at that, okay? So these are photos of the Titanic. The Titanic, as you can see, was really, really big, and it was built from 1909 to 1911. It was actually so big that they didn't have a spot to build it. They had to clear a place just so they could build the ship. So you can imagine how big this ship had to be in order for them to create it. It was 882 feet long. So that's about the size of two and a half football fields. So if you guys have ever gone to your older sister's soccer game or your older brother's football game, think of the field that they're playing on and then put another one and half of one. That's how big the Titanic was. Over 900 people worked on the Titanic. So that could mean the crew members or the chef in the kitchen, definitely the captain himself. There were a lot of people working on this ship. The Titanic's intended course, so where it wanted to go, was from Southampton, England to New York City right here in the US. The picture on the left side of the screen shows the boat right before it left England. So it's docking, which means that it's kind of parked if it were a car, right there on the side, ready to go, ready to board its passengers. On the right side, it shows all the passengers getting ready to board the Titanic. So the Titanic had 2,200 passengers. It left England on April 10th. I see that we have a question. Somebody's raising their hand. If you have a question, definitely put it in the chat box and I'll answer that for you, okay? Um, so the Titanic left, how old is the ship? Jennifer, do you happen to know the answer to that question? Well, it was a brand new ship, so it was only, um a few months old when it went on its first voyage, and then that's when it sank. And then we actually just had the anniversary of the Titanic sinking, didn't we? And that we was did. Amazing. The Titanic that sunk was... April 15th, 1912. Yeah. So just yeah. yesterday was the anniversary. Yeah, so it just sank. Yeah, but like so she said, it was a sank. brand well, like new ship. That's, that's why they had to create the space to build it. So it left England so it on left April England. 10th, 1912, carrying 2,200 passengers, like I said. What year did it sink? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, so hold that question. Would Mr. Andrews, the creator of the Titanic, would he be counted as one of the 900 employees on the ship? That's a good question. When I count the 900 employees, I count everybody who's working on the ship when it sets sail. So people who are working so in the kitchen, who are working kitchen or anywhere or else. Anywhere Jennifer, what else. do you think about Jennifer, that question? what do you think about that question? Yes, he would have been counted as one of the employees because since it was the very first time the ship had sailed, they had a lot of people from the company that built it on board. Because, you know, every time there's something new, things have to get fixed, you have to fix a screw or a doorknob, and they were on the ship to make sure that everything ran smoothly. Yeah, so we have yeah, so a bunch of different things happening. Um, and those are really good questions, guys. Obviously, I'm still learning things too. So it's really great to keep asking your questions. That way we can all figure it out together. How long did it take to make? 
That's a really good question. Jennifer, do you have an exact date on that? Because I want to say at least a couple months. I'd have to look up the exact time, but it was uh, closer to a year between when they actually, because they had to build the ship, they had to lay down the keel, which is that first piece of metal, and then they had to build the whole ship, and then they had to do all the furniture, and the pillows, and the windows, and the curtains, so there were a couple different steps in actually making the ship, and they made two at the same time. They made the Olympic and the Titanic. The Olympic actually sailed first, and then the Titanic, but they were kind of working on both of them at the same time for part of it. Okay, so let's see here, where were we? Right, so on the right side, like I said, that is all the people boarding the ship and it collided with an iceberg and sank, like Jennifer said, on April 15th, 1912. And we're gonna talk more about that later on if you guys have any questions about that sinking. Let's see, what questions do we have? It was about one and a half years, that's what I learned from a book. That's awesome, thanks for telling us. Was the Titanic sister ship, the Olympia, having any problems? I'm not sure about that, actually. I only know about the Titanic. Um, but if anyone has any answers to that, let us know. How many people can board the ship at a time? Jennifer, do you have an exact amount on how many passengers could happen? Uh, we don't have an exact amount because it would depend on how many people were in each cabin. There were a little over 2,000 on Titanic, and it was pretty full. But the second and the third class, um, sometimes you would just get a bunk. If you were first class, you would have almost like a whole apartment. So it depended how many people were actually in each group. Great. So let's talk about the voyage. So this map, you guys, shows you how far the Titanic was going to travel if it had completed its trip. So from New York, to, or from England to America, this is about 3,000 miles. So it's a really long trip. And you can see that it was about two thirds of the way through when the Titanic sank. And like I said, we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. So this is the first question that Therese mentioned that we're gonna have, and you guys already are a pro at the chat box. So this is gonna be really good. This question is, have you and your family ever been on a long trip where did you go and what did you wear? So for example, a couple of years ago, I went with my family to Idaho and it was winter. So it was really, really cold, way different than here in California. So what I packed was a really nice heavy scarf and some snow boots and a really thick jacket. So that was my trip. Why don't you guys tell us in the chat box where you went and what were some of the clothes that you brought with you? You went to Spain, wow. Florida, shorts and bathing suits, that sounds nice right now. Packed outdoor clothing for hiking at Glacier National Park. This is cool, you guys. If you haven't been on a long trip before, you can look at other answers that people are giving and imagine what you would wear if you were going to those places as well. That's a really good way to do it. Grand Canyon, I've been there, that's really cool. Awesome. You guys are pros at this. You have the excellent idea of what to wear. I love all the trips that you've been on. This is really cool. So let's keep going with this. So this takes a look at what people might have worn when they went on the Titanic. What clothing do you guys notice in these pictures? Go ahead and point out some of the, op the objects that you see in the chat box and Jennifer is going to talk more about what they wore. At this time, people who were in different classes would wear different outfits. So if you're first class, you might bring big hats and a fancy blouse and skirts, but you would also have more than one outfit. You would wear something for breakfast, you would wear something for tea, you would wear something for going to the gym, and then you would wear something for dinner, and they would change multiple times a day. Now, the second and third classes were more likely to wear a simple dress or a suit, um, and if they were traveling in third class, they might actually only bring a couple of outfits. So if you were traveling, would you rather bring a bunch of different clothes and then change multiple times a day? Or would you rather just be able to wear the same thing every time? You put your answer in the chat box. 
But so I'm wearing, I'll stand up so you can see a little bit better. I'm wearing my dress. So what class do you think I am? And where do you think I'm going? All right, so Emily, you want to tell us some of what you're saying? Definitely. So let's talk about it. So they're saying that they see you in first class. A few people are saying second class, which I could also see. Um, they're doing really great pointing out different clothes they would wear. And a lot of them would rather wear the same clothes each day. They wouldn't want to change a lot. And I understand that. I wouldn't really want to change a lot either if you're comfortable in your clothing. Um, we had an answer that said that you're in first class and you're going to the ballroom, which I think is a great answer. I think that's a perfect one. A lot of people are saying they'd rather wear the same clothes. You guys are totally right on that. That would definitely be more comfortable. Oh, we had somebody point out unsinkable Molly is very noticeable because of her umbrella and huge hat. That is a great thing to point out. Unsinkable Molly is one of the passengers that was on the Titanic who survived. She is incredible and super brave. Awesome. You guys did great with that. That was awesome. Thank you, Jennifer, for showing off your awesome dress. So this is another question, you guys. So we talked about the clothing that you guys would wear, but I want you to think about that trip again and think about things that you packed beside your clothing. So for example, on every trip, I bring my journal and my phone and a toothbrush. Those are items that I pack. Do you guys have certain items like a book or your stuffed animal that you like to bring with you? Sunscreen, good answer. Food, water, games, journals, CDs, your stuffed animal, a blanket. iPad. iPad. I bring my phone and a book. A penguin pillow, that's a good one. Awesome, you guys have a lot of good ideas for what you would bring with you, that's awesome. So keep those items in mind, because right now we're gonna go ahead and look at some of the items that people would bring with them on the Titanic, okay? So here are a few items that passengers might have carried around with them on the Titanic. So the trunk, which is on the left side of your guys' screen, the big box looking thing, that's similar to what we would bring in our suitcases. So how you guys roll around your suitcases or you have your backpacks, they would bring these trunks with them and put all of their belongings inside. On the right side are some of the items that they would bring. So you can see a bunch of different things there and we're gonna talk about some of them. Are there any special items that you guys notice in that picture of all of the different items that you wanna point out? You can put it in the chat box and I'll read them out. A watch, yep, we're gonna talk about that, and the compass. Why would they bring a compass? Great question, we're gonna talk about that one in a little bit, so hold that question in your mind. What does the teddy bear say? The teddy bear says, White Star Line, RMS Titanic Crew. So that was the boat company and then the boat itself. A cute little teddy bear, I think it's pretty cute too. Awesome. You guys pointed out a lot of good stuff. So we're going to talk more about some of those items right now, including that watch, which was one of the first things that you guys mentioned. So the watches that they had here were very common. They were called pocket watches. They had a chain attached to them so that way they wouldn't be dropped when people had them in their waistcoats or in their pockets or wherever they wanted to keep them. They could open and close with the push of the button. That's the button you see at the top of the pocket watch. And it helped make sure that the face of the clock, so where all the numbers are, wouldn't get scratched. That way they could close the pocket watch and keep things closed. I see that somebody says that they have a pocket watch. That's really cool. I kind of wish I had one because I think it'd be really awesome to carry it around in my pocket. Instead, I just have a watch that I wear. So 
underneath so they were carried around in their pockets that's one of the most common things that we have from titanic either people had them in their pockets when they got on a lifeboat or when they found people later and they had lots of different kinds they had plain ones and then they had really fancy ones that were gold and diamonds and maybe had their initials on them like you can have just a plain watch that's all the time or you can have a super fancy apple watch Somebody said pocket watches are different to regular watches now. Yeah, they are. Po regular watches now, you might think of them as being smaller. You can wear them right on your wrist. Pocket watches, you know, they go in your pocket. They have chains. They look really, really fancy, which I think is pretty cool. So we're going to talk about those little papers that you guys see under the pictures of the pocket watch now. The first one on the left side, underneath the picture of the pocket watch where it's open, that is a postcard. So if you guys don't know what postcards are, maybe you've sent them before, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, they would write on the backs of them and send them to their friends and family to say, hey, wish you were here. This is where we are. So for example, this is a postcard that I got when I was in New York City. There's no writing on the back of mine. I just kept it as a souvenir. But the front, you can see, is a picture of the city, just like how on the front of that one is a picture of the Titanic. On the other side, the other paper is a ticket. So they would bring those on just like you bring tickets to get into sporting games or theater musicals or anywhere that you might go where you have to buy a ticket. So they would bring these and that said that they were a passenger on the Titanic. So I know somebody mentioned why people would use a compass. Um, so we're gonna talk about that one right now. This compass is just like the one the captain would have had if as he steered the ship. So if your parents are in the car and they've ever used their phone or the GPS system to tell them which direction to go, this is exactly what the compass would do for the captain. It would tell him, okay, you're going west right now. And he would think, okay, I need to go north. And it would show him which way he needed to go in order to keep the Titanic sailing through the ocean where it needed to be to hopefully reach New York, but unfortunately it didn't get there. On the left side is an oil lamp. So the oil lamp would be the only thing really lighting the Titanic. Passengers would carry them around when it got dark out, just how we carry around flashlights when it gets dark in our house. But instead of batteries, these lamps used oil and kept itself lit with a flame. So it's kind of like a really early version of, you know, a candle and a flashlight put together. That looks different from today's compasses. There might have been some differences, definitely. I mean, as um, ships have gotten more and more advanced, compasses have changed to be more modern. Maybe they're smaller. This one is a really, really nice looking one. So there's definitely different version of compasses. And if you've ever seen one before, this might not look the exact same way. Was the oil lamp made of glass? Yes, it was. All right, guys, perfect. So let's keep going. So if you were going on the Titanic, what is one item you would bring? We talked about items that you brought with you when you packed, and you can name those again, or you can name some of the things that we just talked about. So maybe you would want to bring the lamp with you or a compass, but I'm really interested in finding out what you guys would want to bring. So go ahead and put that in the chat box and I'll read a couple answers out. Life jacket. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Book. Yeah, so people were going on Titanic for different reasons. Some people were on vacation. They might have gone to a lot of different countries in Europe on a long trip. Some people might be on a business trip. And other people were actually moving from their home country to the United States. So they brought everything they owned with them, everything that they could carry. Something that you guys might have not known is that some of them would actually bring their dogs with them onto the Titanic. So there were some animals that were actually aboard the ship along with the passengers. Somebody would bring a whistle. That's a good one. A blanket and snacks. There were dogs, Ethan. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Warm clothes, the Atlantic is cold. That's a really good point. Jill would want to bring her turtle. I could see that. 
what type of dogs did they have, large or small? There were all different types, actually. There were some big ones, some little ones. It just depended on what people had and which ones they wanted to bring. Did some of the dogs survive? Yes, some of the dogs did survive. Three of the dogs lived, two Pomeranians and one Pekingese. So the little dogs that could fit on somebody's lap in the lifeboat. Was it more the rich people who brought dogs? Jennifer, what do you think about that? Yes, it was mostly the first class passengers who were on vacation bringing their dogs. All right, guys, so let's keep going. Those were all really, really good answers. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened to the Titanic. So you guys are really smart. You've already mentioned that you know that it sinks. Um, you know a lot of what happened to it. I mentioned in the beginning, and I'm sure you know, that the Titanic hit something which made it sink. Do you guys know what it was the Titanic hit? Go ahead and put it in the chat box real quick. An iceberg, awesome. You guys are so quick with this, it's so cool. So this one, this next picture, shows you what an iceberg looks like. So on the surface, it might not look super big. It looks like a big floating piece of ice that you would put in your drink, but underneath the water, Icebergs can be huge, just like this one. So you can see that the bottom is really jagged and that when it hit that ship, it made a really big hole in it. So that is definitely something crazy to think about of how much bigger about, things are when it was bottom underneath the water. And another thing is that it was really bad luck because it was very still that night. The water was very still. You couldn't see the waves up against the iceberg and there was no moon, so it was very, very dark. And there were men whose job it was to look for icebergs, and they were in something called a crow's nest, which was way up at the top of the ship. But they didn't have any binoculars either. It was a new ship, and nobody knew where the key was to open the container. You can hear my dog in the background. I brought one of the dogs with me. But yeah, so the, the men who were supposed to look for the icebergs, they didn't see it until they were right on top of it. All right, guys, so let's talk a little bit more about that. So as I mentioned before, on April 14th, really late at night, after four days at sea, the Titanic collided with an iceberg and it ended up sinking really early in the morning on April 15th, which was just a couple days ago. So the iceberg was jagged under the water, just like we saw in that photo, and it slashed a really large gash in the hull of the ship. So that's the bottom part. It ran right into it. Women and children were given first priority for the lifeboats, which are just like what you guys would see here. Only 706 passengers survived. If you guys remember in the beginning, I said that 2,200 passengers were on the ship, plus about 900 crew members. But because they didn't have a lot of lifeboats on the ship, they were only able to take off 706 people when the ship started to sink. So people have asked why they didn't have enough lifeboats for everybody. But, but the idea at the time is not everybody was supposed to be in a lifeboat at the same time. They had their wireless, uh, which they could use to call for another ship. And if you've ever heard Morse code, it's the beeps. So if you've heard SOS, it's beep, 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 beep. And so they would call another ship and the other ship would go by and then they would just need to use the lifeboats to move people from one ship to the other one. But it turned out that the other ships were too far away. They weren't able to get to Titanic before the boat actually sank. So it's kind of like thinking you'll always be okay as long as you have your cell phone with you, but people might be too far away. You might not have the signal. So let's talk more about the survivors. So these are the survivors in one of the lifeboats that we talked about. Um, Jennifer is actually gonna talk more with you guys about the survivors and about how that all went down. So yes, this is actually a picture of one of the lifeboats that was taken by the ship called Carpathia. Now Carpathia was one of the closest ships and they were the only one that heard a distress call was close enough to come help. So they 
actually did a rescue mission. They woke everybody up and they started putting more coal in the boilers. The ship would go faster and they started brewing coffee and soup. And then they looked around and looked around and they finally saw the lifeboats and they were able to take pictures of these. So the first couple lifeboats weren't full because everybody thought it was safer to stay on the ship because they heard it was unsinkable. But then later when they realized that the ship really was going to sink, everybody tried to get in the lifeboats and the later lifeboats were full. So this is a picture of from the Carpathia of the actual Titanic survivors the first time they saw that lifeboat. And then this is a picture actually on the deck of the Carpathia. So the Carpathia picked up all of the people that survived Titanic. And this is a picture of the women, a lot of them lost their husbands. And so they were known as the widow seats, these chairs were. And so there weren't enough rooms for everybody. So they set up temporary rooms in the dining room and in other rooms on the ship. Uh, but a lot of times people were just kind of sitting on deck because they didn't have a, a new room. But the passengers of Carpathia were really nice and they gave people extra clothes and toothbrushes and blankets um, while they waited to get back to New York. Awesome. So the next thing that I have for you guys is actually a video of a couple survivor stories. So what I want you to do is I want you to watch this super carefully. We're going to show two or three stories and then we're going to talk about it a little bit after. So pay really close attention to what they're saying and see which one stood out to you the most. Lawrence Beasley, an English science teacher, journalist and author, boarded the Titanic as a second class passenger. He had been in his cabin reading when the collision with the iceberg occurred. Beasley stopped a steward to ask what had happened, but was advised that it was nothing. Luckily, he made his way up to A deck and was ordered to jump into lifeboat number three just before it launched. He wrote a successful book about his experience called The Loss of the SS Titanic that was published just nine weeks after the disaster. Frederick Fleet, an English crewman and lookout on the RMS Titanic, was one of the first to spot the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. Fleet believed the iceberg could have been spotted earlier had the only pair of binoculars on the Titanic been used instead of stored in an officer's locker. This may have given the Titanic more time to evade the iceberg and could have prevented the sinking altogether. Fleet was assigned to lifeboat number six to assist the passengers and was among the survivors rescued by the Carpathia. Violet Constance Jessup, an Argentinian stewardess aboard the Olympic, Titanic's sister ship, was persuaded by her friends to sign on as a stewardess for the Titanic's maiden voyage. She was half asleep in her bunk when the collision occurred and was immediately ordered up on deck. Jessup was ordered into lifeboat number 16 and given a baby to look after. After eight hours, the passengers aboard lifeboat number 16 were rescued by the Carpathia and the baby was reunited with its mother. Jessup later survived the sinking of the Britannic, another sister ship of the Titanic. Dorothy Gibson, an American silent film actress, model, and singer, was one of the more famous people aboard the Titanic. She was playing bridge with her friends in the lounge when the Titanic collided with the iceberg. Gibson and two of her friends escaped in lifeboat number seven, the first life. All right, so that cut off a little bit, but you guys get the feeling of the survivor stories. So what I'm wondering is, are there any survivor stories that stood out to you the most? We saw three different ones. Um, so if any details stood out to you, anything at all, go ahead and put that in the chat box and I'll read a couple of your observations. It's really cool hearing the survivor Titanic, Titanic survivor stories. I think it shows us a lot about what happened. The actor stood out, absolutely. She stood out to me too. The one where he wrote a book. I think that is really cool that he was able to write the book about it because I think that'd be really awesome to read that. Somebody said they also want to read it. You should. That would be really cool, and you should tell us how it, how it is. A lot of people think that the author stood out to you. That's awesome. The woman that survived two sinking ships. Absolutely. Can you imagine that? Not just one, but two. I was wondering if the baby and mom would reunite too, and they did. I know, that's a happy ending to that story, so I'm really glad that they were able to reunite. Awesome. Okay, guys, you are doing great. We're going to keep on going. 
So these are what newspapers looked like back then. And Jennifer is going to tell you more about how newspapers got the info and all the other stuff that went along with printing this information. So like I said earlier, a lot of the way that people spread news because they didn't have the internet, they didn't have cell phones, uh, was through the wireless, through the Morse code. So it's all just those beeps. So if you're hearing lots of different beeps overlapping, sometimes it's hard to tell what's what. And so the very first newspapers, so they did find out very soon that Titanic had an iceberg. But the very first newspaper said that Titanic had an iceberg and was being towed to Canada. Now they heard part of the news that Titanic heard an iceberg, but then they heard part of another story which said a different ship was being to Canada. So the very first newspapers got part of the story right, but part of it off. And that kind of happens today sometimes too, when people want to get the first story out and it's not always right. So then the later stories got more correct information, and these are some of the ones that you see where it actually reported what happened to the people on Titanic. Awesome. So there's lots of different ones like you see here. Um, at my work at the Reagan Library, we actually have Titanic trunks and in there we have some of the newspapers and being able to see these newspapers are really cool. They're really old and really fragile, but they're awesome to look at. So if you ever have a chance to go to the library or anywhere that might have some old newspapers, not just about the Titanic, but about anything, I really encourage you guys to look it up because it can be really cool to see different stories from a couple years ago or a long time ago. So I recommend that you able that you look at those if you're able to. So we're going to transition a little guys. We're going to talk about when they actually found the Titanic where it was sitting on the bottom of the ocean. It was about 100 years after the fact which is now and in 85 is when a researcher was underwater and he was doing some research down there looking at the ocean floor and he actually found the wreck of the Titanic. And so he, it, he noticed that it had all different types of ocean life growing on it. It had barnacles, if you've ever seen those, and algae and all sorts of things all over it. And he was able to record a little bit of a video. So I'm gonna show you guys the video of what he saw when he found the Titanic. So that shows you guys a little bit of what he was looking at. So like I said before, there is a lot of stuff covering the Titanic because it's been on the bottom of the ocean for so long. Somebody asked if there's live footage of the crash impact. There's not. At that time, they didn't have the video cameras that we have today. So they only had really early versions of cameras. So they were able to take the pictures, like the ones you've seen, but they weren't able to get any video or anything of the actual crash. So. How deep was it? That's a good question, Joshua. I'm actually not sure how far under the water the Titanic was when they found it. it. It's actually almost two miles under the water, which is why it took so long to find it. Perfect. So I'm wondering if you guys have a word that describes how you feel after seeing that video. The first time I saw it, my first thought was, wow, that is really far under the water. A lot happened in there. So what are some words that you guys have? And I'll point them out. Sad, that's the first one, absolutely sad. Cool, I agree, it is pretty cool to see it and all the different stuff that's on it. 
well-preserved. That's actually a really interesting point. I could see how you would see that it's well-preserved. The ocean did a really good job keeping everything together, but we're also going to talk about how it was falling apart. Mysterious. I like that one. That's a good one. Amazing and interesting. I think that's a really good job, guys. Haunting. That's a, you guys are awesome with all your words. Wow. So let's talk a little bit more about the ocean and what it's doing to the Titanic. So on the left side, you guys see pictures of it in 2018, which was two years ago. So pretty recent photos. You can see that it has all the rust on it. It has all the stuff from the ocean. Researchers think that because of how powerful the ocean is, it's actually going to break the Titanic apart. So if you look at the right side, that's what they're thinking it's going to look like in a hundred years. So you can see that the railing is disintegrating, different parts of the boat are falling off. So we're really lucky that we're able to see the Titanic now. So I saw that one of you actually pointed out earlier um, saying that the Titanic 2 was happening. And that's really awesome that you knew that. We're going to talk more about that right now. So there's a new ship being built. It's called the Titanic 2. It's supposed to have more lifeboats. And if anyone has ever been on a cruise and had to do a lifeboat drill on the first day, it's because of the Titanic. A lot of cruise ships now have way more precautions when it comes to lifeboats. So the Titanic 2 is going to have more lifeboats. It's going to have stronger material on the ship on the boat so that way it doesn't sink when it if it hits anything but it won't hit anything because they have new technology imagine when your parents get a new car or if you get a new gaming system and it's faster and it has all these different gadgets in it that's what they're going to have on the titanic too they're going to have all this different stuff that way they're able to see what's happening so the current goal of that is to set sail in 2022 that's only two years away. I don't know about you guys, but that seems pretty crazy to think about. How old are you guys gonna be in two years? Cause I want you to think about that and then think about our last question. Do you wanna go on the new Titanic? Why or why not? I saw that somebody already said yes. A lot of people are saying no. <laughs> and I understand your guys' precautions after you've done so much awesome work today on our presentation. A lot of people are saying yes, that's awesome you guys. I think you should go and you should take lots of pictures and you should tell everyone about it. We are superstitious. I completely agree with you there. Okay, Luke is saying big nopes all across the board. Well guys, it's been really awesome chatting with you. I love that you guys were so involved and so interested in the Titanic. I wanna give a big thank you to all of you for coming to our online class. If you have any questions about anything, go ahead and put it in the chat box and I'll read them out and myself or Jennifer will answer. Um, and then we'll log off in a couple minutes after we're all done. Why can't we pull up the Titanic? That's a really good question, Casey. Jennifer, do you have a good answer for why they wouldn't be able to pull up the Titanic? There's two reasons. One is that it's so far down and it's so fragile that if you tried to do that, it would break. The other reason is when you think about it, it's kind of like a cemetery because there were a lot of people that died there and it's kind of disrespectful to try to bring it up. So that's one of the feelings that a lot of people have about why we shouldn't bring it up. Real quick, guys, before we go back to any questions that you have about the Titanic, a couple people are asking if this will be posted as an online document or if we're offering any more classes. We definitely are. Um, if your parents head to the link where they signed you guys up for this, it has a whole list of all the different classes. Um, if you go to all of that sort of thing, it'll also post the videos of us talking here today and presenting. So you're definitely able to take a lot more classes. I recommend it. I'm signed up for a bunch of them. I think they're really cool. It's on Facebook if your parents want to go on there and find it. Um, and I highly recommend that you do so because it's awesome. We're reading Ghost I Have Been where there are really passengers named Beatrix and Julian Poindexter. I'm not sure on exact names of passengers, but if it's the book I'm thinking of, I think that is loosely based 
on it. So it's historical fiction. So it has all the facts of the Titanic, but the characters in it are actually not real. They're just based on real life people. I remember when I was in fifth grade, I think we had to read a book on, about the Titanic passengers. And it was about a girl that would be your guys' age who was one of the passengers on board. Is it true that the band on the ship went down with the ship while playing music, trying to calm people down? Jennifer will have to back Jennifer me up on this. Jennifer will have to back me up on this. That is true. Uh, the band did play on the deck as long as they possibly could to try to comfort people, people in the lifeboats who survived, remember hearing the music, and the last song that anybody knew the band played was uh, I Got To Thee. And they actually found the band leader when they looked for people after the ship sank, and they found him, and they found his music pouch, and they found his violin. So if any of you guys have seen when your parents are watching the movie Titanic, or maybe you've watched it yourself, they have that really crazy scene of the ship sinking, and it shows the musicians playing, and it's really, really good to watch. So that is a true thing, and thank you, Jennifer, for backing up on that. Are there any other questions that you guys might have? How much would Titanic for the Titanic how much would tickets for the Titanic 2 cost? I'm not sure, actually. I don't think they've announced any official pricing or anything yet. They're still waiting for everything to come into completion on the building of the ship and all of the details. So you'll have to keep an eye out for that and see if they say anything. Did the captain go down with the ship and is this where the phrase came from? That's a really good question, Luke. I believe that the captain did go down with the ship. Jennifer? Yes, the captain did go down with the ship. And it's the phrase didn't come from Titanic. The phrase came from the tradition that the captain would be the last person off the ship. So if anybody wasn't able to get off, uh, usually the captain would stay with the ship. All right, you guys, well, it looks like we're kind of running out of questions. Um, if you think of anything, I encourage you to look up more about the Titanic, read more about it. Um, there's a lot of great articles. That's how I learned about a lot of this stuff. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day and that your friends and family are safe and healthy. And once again, I encourage you to check out other online classes that are being offered. We have a lot of really great stuff and your parents will know more about it um, with how they signed you up for this. So go ahead and check those out. And I will see you in another class, I suppose. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer and Emily. We really appreciate your time and expertise. And thank you everybody for joining who joined us. Bye, everybody.